North Carolina A&T, just like Hampton, leaves the Big South in favor of the CAA. Did Eddie George just give the Ohio Valley Conference Tennessee State's two-week notice? And we have some standouts from this weekend's HBCU Legacy Bowl. Oh, yeah. It's locked on HBCU. Play my music. <laughs> on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day day in North Carolina A&T makes the move that I feel like they needed to do and that is going just like Hampton did to the CAA and leaving the Big South and the mass exodus of the Big South continues in North Carolina A&T is just the last domino to fall who knows if they'll be the last but they are the most recent domino to fall for sure and it's 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 like this the Big South is crumbling in North Carolina, A&T didn't want to be get caught in the wreckage. It's, ju it's just that simple. That's what's happening. You look at it. Hampton left. Monmouth left. Um, Kennesaw State left. Uh, who else left? Um, North, North Alabama left. All of these teams are leaving. This is not a healthy situation anymore. It isn't. It's too many teams to be leaving. And... I feel bad for North Carolina a and because, look, they made the step to leave the MEAC, and that's a big deal. Leaving an HBCU conference that you've been in with so or that you've been in for so long and just so comfortable with everyone around you, look, boom, HBCU, 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 HBCU. And for you to leave and to go to a completely new environment, man, that took a lot. And I'm sure it was, it was stepping out of a comfort zone is something that they decided that they wanted to do. And when they did it, they did go somewhere where they could feel at least a tad bit of comfortability, just a little bit. And that was in the Big South with Hampton. And this is where I get into the kind of feeling bad for them section because you think that Hampton's going to be there. You think that you're going to have at least one HBCU by your side, somebody that's relatively close to you as well, being in Virginia. Um, then they leave. You get there for a year and they leave and they go to CAA. Now you're following suit. And I don't think they're just saying, well, wherever Hampton goes, we'll go. This invitation was extended to them in November of 2021. So it took a while before it happened. Let's just be very clear. So this is the second time, though. One thing I want to compare some, some similarities. This is the second time that the Aggies have left a conference whose numbers was were dwindling. And, you know, you could say in the first time that they were they were part of the dwindling of the MEAC. I, I will completely understand that. But when you look at it and you say, in this situation, there's four teams. I just named them. You know, North Alabama, Kennesaw State, Hampton, Monmouth, all of these teams are leaving. And now you're sitting here like, I came here for prosperous new beginnings. I, it looks like I'm here for the for the doomsday, the ending. It's no longer it's no longer a situation where, oh, I see the Big South is somewhere where the grass is greener. The grass is not greener. You know, and I don't think it's fair to call it a miscalculation on the Aggies part, because. Who could have saw four teams, four teams leaving? Now, now they're the fifth, right? They're the fifth. And they have nine football teams. Who could have projected that over half of the of the teams in the Big South would have left? So I'm not really gonna knock them for that. I'm not gonna call it a miscalculation, but I do think that you have you ever been you've been dropped, of course you've been dropped, right? And you're using your your whatever your direction app of choice is, and you pass your turn up and they recalculate you. That's what this is. You weren't going to the wrong destination. You had a destination in mind, but it's like, look, you might have to have a new route. And that's what it is. So now once you leave, you missed that one turn. It's like, well, now you have to go down a different road. And that different road is going into the CAA. Um, let's look at this, though. There's now five teams that remain because North Carolina and T decided to stay for football. And we'll talk about that in a second. But 
there's five teams that remain in this conference. Something has to change, period. Something has to change. If you're the Big South, just for the Big South portion of it, and we're going to talk about them real quick, but you can't you can't continue to lose numbers because they're talking about how they're still a healthy and stable conference. You don't look like it. You don't. The writing was on the wall, and North Carolina a t did right. I'll say that. North Carolina a t made the correct decision to leave and go to the CAA because if half of your teams leave in a single offseason, you're not somewhere that I really want to be. There is no stability here. The stability is a theme of the next two segments or this segment and the next segment. There is none here. Why would I want to be here? This is not what I need to do. It's not meant for me to flourish or anything like that. And in this new conference that's expanding, you're not dwindling, you're expanding. The grass does once again looks clean, looks greener, looks like it's more stable over there, and I approve of this move. And it's not a situation where oh, I just can't stand the hard times. Like, can you stand the rain? No, you can't stand the rain. That's why the Aggies left. No, they left because this is not the situation that they chose to get into. And they're not married to them. They've been there for one year. They should not be married to the Big South. And one of the reasons that it was an easy decision, not an easy decision, but a, a decision that they made was because issues with football scheduling, which means they didn't have enough teams. And then also there was a situation with markets that they played in, the budget. And at the end of the day, you're now facing teams like UNC uh, Wilmington. You're now facing teams like Hampton once again. You're now going to face teams that are in North Carolina. You have two teams in North Carolina. You have three teams in, in Virginia. Like Richmond is still there, and you're just in your neighboring state. It's right there. It's a lot less travel because the CAA is going to divide things up into divisions. So there's so much freedom. And also, academics is a big thing for Hampton. That's the same thing with North Carolina a and and they're they're striving. They're trying to get to the R1 status, which is like the precipice of academic um, just regard and how you regard it. That's that. But at the same time, they're at an R2. They're trying to get up there. CAA has four R1 institutions. C2 is higher research, and that's great. But they're trying to get to the number one, right? You're still trying to keep going because that is as high as you can go. That's the black belt. I'm a, I'm a martial artist. That's the black belt of university and just how you're perceived. And looking at it, football and bowling will not be in the Big South this year or will not be in the CAA this year. Bowling, they decided to keep that in the MEAC because they kept it in the MEAC when it went to the Big South, and nothing has changed since. They want to keep bowling there. I'm okay with that. I can't complain. I'm typically not a fan of splitting up, but I'll 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 make an exception for keeping it in the HBCU Conference of the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. I'm okay with that. Football, I love this. It's the loyalty of saying, I don't want to have your automatic FCS playoff bid canceled. So I'm going to stay for a year. You got a year. You got 365 days, a little bit more even, because I gave you much heads up before July 1st, which is when this all goes into order. And it says you have that long to find some sort of replacement. If you can't find a replacement in a year, I'm gone. Regardless, I'm gone and you're just out of luck. So I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to leave you out to dry. I think that was a very commendable decision, and I think it was respectable because this is something that the Big South said that they appreciated. That that automatic buy, or excuse me, that automatic bid into the FCS playoffs is something that all these conferences covet. And by not having the minimum amount of player or teams, that was going to be something that that conference was going to miss. So they said, you know what? I'll give you one more year. One more year so that you have your automatic bid. After that, us and all of our sports are done with the Big South. I appreciate it, all your time, the year that you had, but I got to go somewhere where I feel like I can flourish. And that's something that they were able to do. I think they made the right move, and I think they made the necessary move to continue the advancement of North Carolina a and And going forward, I'll be talking about another school that might be saying it's time to go as far as their conference goes. I'm not quite sure. We're going to break this down together, though. And going forward, I want to tell you about bet online because bet online is the best place to wager on all of your favorite sports i look at it and i say basketball season is kicking in football season is done and that's my thing but basketball season is kicking in and now i have so many player props that i can do i can wager on this i can wager on players i can wager on on teams i can wager on all of these things and even if that isn't your cup of tea that's fine because they have other things such as boxing such as ufc i just mentioned the the black belt right so i'm a ufc guy you can wager on, on that. Baseball is going to come back. I'm going to keep mentioning it here until it finally comes back, but it will be coming back eventually. 
You want to do hockey? All of those things are available on betonline.net. They are the top wagering place and the exclusive partner of the Locked On Network. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wage on all of your favorite sports. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, we keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked On HBCU. I want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day every day. And today's word of the day is invincible, meaning incapable of being conquered, overcome, or subdued. That is invincible. And Eddie George, I don't know if he just gave his two-week notice or Tennessee State's two-week notice to the Ohio Valley Conference or if he just fired off a warning shot. But he had a lot to say, and he just went on a podcast and – Listen, y'all know I ain't about to give out that podcast name because it ain't locked on. If you want us to give out the locked on name or the name, then come on locked on. It's really that simple. Come on locked on, Buckeye. All right, go to your alma mater. Or come on, talk to us locked on HBCU, fellas. All right, because we try, we trying to show love. So come on here and I'll drop the name of the podcast that you said it on. But until then, and no free promotion, just like my girl Tiana Taylor said, it's really that simple. All right, but he went on a podcast and he had a lot of interesting things to say. It was a very interesting podcast. Um, I listened to about half of it. I'm going to definitely go finish it up. But it was something where you're talking about a Southern Heritage Classic. He was talking about like financials and Bitcoin and things of that nature, his journey to becoming a Tennessee State coach, um, some of the businesses that he started. But in that, he had one interesting soundbite, and that was about the future of Tennessee State and why seemingly, or at least in, I'm not even going to say insinuated, he said it, that there's a very good possibility that they're leaving. And I want to break down some of these quotes. I'm going to keep going because I thought there was a lot of things within this that were very interesting. And one of the things is he was speaking on a Southern Heritage Classic when he brought it up. I was so upset that the, that the, the host didn't try to push more to get more information out of this soundbite because it felt so abrupt. It felt so abrupt. And like I said, one of the interesting things was talking about him them leaving the Ohio Valley Conference where it's somewhere that they have been in for a long time. They've been in the Ohio Valley Conference since 1986. Like, this isn't a situation where, and I want to draw the line in between them and North Carolina A&T and and Hampton, because this isn't a situation like they've been here for the course of five decades, right? Five different decades they've been in this conference, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and now 2020s. So they have a lot invested within this conference it's not like a and t who just left the MEAC and now they're trying to find their footing it's not like hampton who just left the MEAC and trying to find their footing no they've been an a non-hbcu conference affiliate forever for over for over 30 years nearly 40 at this point right so this is in a situation where they're trying to bounce around and see where they fit they know where they fit they just no longer feel like they fit there I'm not going to give too much because I do want to give the quote and break down why it's a complicated situation. It's not cut and dry. I'm not quite sure if he's giving a warning shot or if he is saying we're done, we're gone, period. But I do want to set up a little bit of the context because for 30 years, they were the only ones. They were the original variants. They were the first ones to branch off and be in the FCS uh, division, but not be in an HBCU conference, right? So... Now that I've given the difference between them in North Carolina a and and Hampton, I also want to now give the quote because Eddie George brought it up. Like I said, he brought it up in the midst of talking about the Southern Heritage Classic, and it's easy to miss. It was very easy to miss. But when talking about it, I heard it, and I wanted to make sure that it was highlighted. So it was so unnecessary. It was so unnecessary. It, did, it didn't even really feel like it fit. But I know it wasn't accidental. So let's talk about it. Here goes the quote. We're going into a different time and age. For us now, obviously, with Tennessee State, we are seeking to go to a conference that has more stability. The OVC is a dying conference at this point in time. Hopefully, we can continue to stay. Hopefully, that OVC leadership will pick and continue to add teams. But at some point, we're going to have to take into account our future and do what's best for Tennessee State and find stability. So I've given you the context. I've given you the context around it. I've given you the Itself. And I want to ask you the question, did Eddie George fire off a warning shot or does he give his two-week notice? And listen to me, the difference is a two-week notice is immediate. We're leaving. A warning shot? 
That means we're thinking about it. You better get your stuff together. And to me, I'm leaning towards a warning shot because if you listen to that, there's no real plan. And we're going to go line by line and break this down. There's no real plan in there. And Eddie George, from this from this conversation, everything I've ever heard from him, seems like a guy who will only act with a plan. So if that means there's no plan, I don't think he's just going to go and just willy-nilly do it. It means that he has no plans on immediately doing it, but they will. Now let's look at it line by line. We're going into a different time and age. That signifies change immediately. We're going into a different time and age. Now, whether we're discussing the landscape of HBCUs or if we're discussing Tennessee State is going into a different time and age, I don't know. But now you get to us. For us now, obviously, with Tennessee State, we are seeking to go to a conference that has more stability. Boom. That's the problem. The issue is the fact that there is no stability within the OVC. There has been a lot of turnover. There's been a lot of teams who have left the OVC. They've added a couple, but there's been a lot of teams that have left, very similar to the Big South. Those are the problem. You have four teams leave that conference in this, in this offseason as well. There's going to go. Some are going to the ASUN, the ASUN, right? But there's some, there's some instability as far as who's going to be a part of the conference. So I get it. Now here you go. The OVC, it's a dying conference at this point in time. There is no explanation there. OVC, the Ohio Valley Conference, is a dying conference. That is telling on how the head coach of one of their football programs feel. Now, here goes the, the confusion. Hopefully, we can stay. So you want to stay. Hopefully, OVC leadership will pick and choose, pick and continue to add teams. Okay, so you're hoping for the success of this. But at some point, we're going to have to take into account our future and do what's best for Tennessee State. Basically, I want to be here, but I'm going to do what's good for me. I'm going to do what's good for me. And here's the last line, and find stability. That's the second time that he mentioned stability. So you know the issue is stability. There is no stability in their mind. And this isn't the first time that they've ever discussed leaving. I think I've seen a, an, an interview maybe two years ago just discussing the idea of Tennessee State leaving. This is before Eddie George even got hired. So. When I look at it, you start off saying, we need to go, or we're looking to go, period. We're looking to leave to go to a conference that has more stability. This conference is dying, but I hope we can stay. I hope they do this, that, and the third so that we can stay. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing when I read this. But at some point, I have to do what's good for me. See, at first, it says I'm looking to leave. I'm seeking. That means we're trying to go. But then you say, at some point, seeking sounds like immediate, at some point feels like the future. We'll see what it is, but that's what I'm seeing with both of these, well, in both of these lines. I'm seeing one side that says, look, we need to go. Sounds to me, you know you need to stop. This relationship is not working anymore. But there's something in there. Maybe it's the history. Maybe it's the fact that you see the potential to grow. I'm comfortable. Whatever that case is. But I know this relationship is not working anymore. It does not provide me with what I need. But I've been in it for so long. I want to give them a chance. This is a warning shot. In other words, these are the things that I have problems with. You need to fix it or I am gone. Point blank, period. That's what it is. And going forward, I'm going to, I'm going to list out some of the standouts from this year's HBCU Legacy Bowl. Because I have two from each team, two from Gaither and two from Robinson, one on defense, one on offense for each. But first, I want to tell you about Rock Auto, because there are so many makes and models of your car that you go into the auto parts store and there's no guarantee that they'll have everything you need. And it's, it wouldn't be a surprise if they didn't. However, when I'm looking at it, I say, I have somewhere I can go where I don't even have to get out of bed. I can lay in bed, grab my laptop, grab, grab my phone, do whatever I feel like. Don't I can cuddle up in my bed, and I can go to Rock Auto, and I know they'll have everything. No more asking me questions like, is it this kind of odyssey or is it that kind of odyssey? I'm just going to put in the information. I have to talk to a minimal amount of people. I can get my parts at a very cheap price. That's the first thing, 30% less. That's number one. I can get all the parts. I know they're all going to be there. That's number two. And they're family-owned, so you know those, those type of places, they always make you feel good. You ever went to a family-owned restaurant? Makes you feel good. And it's that same type of feel for Rock Auto. All right? So go to rockauto.com. Get all of these benefits of lesser price, less travel, less hassle. It's so much better in so many different types of ways. 
And when you go to rockauto.com, make sure you put locked on in the how did you hear about a section. Tell them the mouth of the South sent you. All right, as we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked On HBCU, I want to give my two standouts from each team in the HBCU Legacy Bowl. Both Team Gaither and Team Robinson had a couple of players that I thought played really well. And I want to start off with the victors. I want to start off with the winners. That is Team Gaither, which was Team MIAC and Team CIAA. But the player that I want to highlight came from Southern. That's Marquise McClain. For some reason, I think it was the amount of wide receivers, if I remember correctly, the amount of wide receivers that were on each team wasn't proportionate. So they decided to give McLean to Southern. And boy, did he tear them Southern, uh, tear them SWAC and SEAC players up because I don't know what it was. Because you look at the offensive player of the, of the game in Higbottom, he was a former Grambling player. So he was familiar with the Southern competition or the SWAC competition, excuse me. I don't know if maybe that gave them an advantage, but those are the two most impressive players on that Gaither offense to me. And with McLean, he was the most consistent target of all the skill weapons. Whether that was running backs running the ball or receivers catching, I felt like he was the best. And that's why he is my standout. And he made an impact from the moment that he touched the ball. And look, I know that sounds real like, like a cliche, but I'm not just blowing smoke. Because when I look at it, I say the first time that he touched the ball was on the third down. It was third and six. And he caught the ball, and it was about inches. He caught the ball. It was actually not the best pass. It was on his back shoulder, and he was coming off of contact. He was getting bumped, and he was able to catch it. Had to catch it two times, corralled it. And when he finally started to turn up field, he got hit. Got hit pretty hard. He got rocked, not going to lie. But he didn't go down because the guy did not wrap up. And he didn't go down. So he gathered himself. And on a situation where he got hit probably inches, maybe feet short from the first down line, he ended up getting eight, eight, nine more yards and going seven yards beyond the first down line. I thought that was very impressive because this is a guy who people are talking about playing tight end. Some scouts think he could play tight end. I, I want him to play slot receiver. I think he's good at that. But he showed out, man. And he was doing that at multiple levels, going across the field. Um, Like I said, levels one, two, and three. Define them how you want. I was close or short passes, medium passes, and then also longer passes. He was doing it all. I thought he was really good. And he was somebody who was highlighted before the game. And you saw the reason why. He had a lot of talent. He sits about in the 215 area, 6'2". I don't want to see him at tight end. I get it. But I don't want to see him at tight end. I think he's more of a slot receiver. I think that's where he could really fit in. And I think he'd be really good there. He's a receiver who can go across the middle at all levels of the field. And got open for every quarterback that he had that he uh, played with. So it's a Southern guy. Sorry. Sorry, man. I, I think Team Robinson really could have used him on the squad. But then also for my defensive side, I want to talk about Deshaun or Deshaun Dixon out of Norfolk State defensive end. And he's a guy who stood out all week and he punctuated his great week at the Legacy Bowl with an exclamation point. And that was a, a performance where he ended with a tackle and a half for tackles for loss. And the worst part about defensive linemen and really just pressuring the quarterback in general is there's so many stats that you'll never see because they, they're just not shown. They don't have forced incompletions due to hurry. That's not something that you see. And even hurry isn't even shown unless you have a situation where you have advanced stats available. And there was no advanced stats for this. So he did. He was able to get a tackle for a loss. And I felt I felt very happy because when you look at what he did, he showed off his length with his arms. Right. And then he also showed a moves and we love a guy who doesn't just have one move. Now I want to get into some of the guys from the team Robinson squad, which was SWAC and CA. Both of these players are going to come from the SWAC, though. And I felt like Antoine Rob, Antoine Collier, excuse me. Antoine Collier was definitely the choice for the standout on the defensive side. He was a defensive MVP. I mean, what else was he going to be? Right. So he was a guy who, in my opinion, Collier benefited so much from being able to get in front of these scouts, being able to get in front of these team representatives and say, this is who I am. You might have heard this, that, and the third, but this is who I am. Don't detail me by things that may have happened in the past. I am this man today. And I think that overall, there was no real question in his ability. We've seen it, especially on a D1 level, right? We've seen it on the FBS level when they were a perfect squad. We've seen him play for, for UCF. So there's no question in the talent, but I think some people might have had some character issues and 
a lot of times they just write you, they write, they'll write you off or write you as whatever happened. But now with a chance to be able to look at you and be like, this is the man I am today. I feel like those, those woes, those concerns are kind of subsided a little bit, hopefully. But on the field, he showed, hey, I can rewind that clock. I'm still that guy from 2017 who had all these tackles, who had these interceptions, who was a guy who flew around the field. And that's what he did in this game. He flew around the field. He led the game with nine tackles. And they played a lot of single high safety. So occasionally he had to be back there deep. And, well, they played a lot of single high because that was the rule. You're supposed to only be able to play cover one, cover three, both single high coverages. So those were the situations that he was put in sometimes, occasionally whether he was deep safety or the down safety. But regardless, he was always around the ball. He was always around the ball because um, he had nine tackles. He had one and a half tackles for a loss. And we said that with Dixon as well. But he coming from a safety position. He's not coming from the defensive line. So for him to be able to do that is even more impressive. You know, that's not to compare the uh, not to compare the two or take one down than the other. But it's like, man, I got to give you even extra kudos for being able to get a, a tackle and a half for loss in the run game as a safety. That means you coming down here and you firing. And you find the ball, you a heat seeking missile. So those are all the things that he was able to do really well. And also, I hope that during the week, I don't have any information on that, but during the week, I just hope that he was able to showcase who he is as a player, who he is, excuse me, who he is as a man. And then as on as a player, he was able to do that on Saturday. And then for my for my offensive player of the of the game for them, it was between the kill glass of Alabama AM, and then it was also between Juwan Pass and Prairie View. And I ended up going with glass. Akil Glass out of Alabama A&M. And that was because I felt like he had some really standout moments. He had the highs. And I know his stat line doesn't look the greatest in pass, led them to their one one um scoring drive for Robinson. And I, I, I understand that. But when I think about it, I look at the throws that he was able to make and what I saw. He came in. They say when it's a tie, give it to the champ, right? And he came in with all of the praise. And I don't feel like he completely disappointed. Um. So, but in not just a situation where you give it to the guy who got the praise, but I also thought, like I said, he had three passes that I thought was top-notch throws. I'm gonna say that top-notch throws. And only one ended up being complete, but I thought one was one was definitely dropped. Um, I think there's some alligator arms from the receiver coming across the middle that I think he should have made that catch. Then the second one, he threw it to De Anderson. It was the first pass of the game for him. He went to saw he saw De Anderson on the sideline, threw it. I feel like Anderson got both feet down, but there was no replays. They called it one foot on the, on the ground, live in the game. I personally think he got two feet in, and I thought it was a really good throw and catch. And then the last one was arguably the best throw of the day, and that was a situation where he had two ends crashing down on him, and he still stood in the pocket strong and delivered a, a absolute thread between multiple receivers, multiple defenders, and Mallard, the, the recipient of that thread, was able to run with it. But, man... That was a beautiful throw, and the best throw of the day, in my opinion, by any quarterback was that throw right there. So that's why I ended up giving it to Glass, just because I feel like his highs were better as an individual, not just on the team side. I just felt like those three throws gave him the nod to me. Um, but those are your there, those are your standouts from this year's Legacy Bowl. Man, I can't wait. I think we're going to get that, this in maybe one more time before the end of the week. So look forward to that. Make sure you're making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day and for your second listen of the day you need to be checking out ryan tracy former nfl cornerback eric crocker they're doing all your draft needs locked on nfl draft is everything you need to get prepared the draft is coming up in no time so you never know man don't wait until a week before the draft and then try to consume all this knowledge they're breaking it down and they're one of the best podcasts that we have on this network so in the meantime, in between time, y'all know where y'all can find me on that blue app, that bird. Yes, Twitter, at South Exclusives. Until the next time they hear each other, family. Take care, stay blessed. Peace.